of the fourth study, chapter four of No Other Gospel, part B. And uh, we left off with, um, remember Peter was warning against the coming heresies, what was coming down the pike, and uh, that these heretics would lure the weaker types, in his own words, and you can read about that again in 2 Peter 2. And then also the, he was warning against those teachers that bring a divisive spirit that cause this kind of separation. Um, the, the church just keeps splitting and splitting and splitting, and it separates one Christian from another and uh, distracts us from our work in the Lord of discipleship and service and love and brings us into kind of like a political brawl where we're arguing over every little detail. So he says, warn against, he warns against those. And then also there was a St. Cyril of Alexandria. Remember he said in his words that there is there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And that kind of sums it up. And then we finally close with Jesus' commissioning of the apostles, um, which, of course, that commissioning is handed down through the church as it is to today. So to bring us up to speed, we're now going to open up with a little bit about Paul before Damascus. And I always love learning about Paul because when we feel like we're kind of on a wayward track, well, at least we weren't running around persecuting the church and throwing, dragging every last woman and child into jail. So, you know, it's really fun to hear about his story and then to think that he wrote the majority of our New Testament. So this guy is one fired up guy with an interesting life. So now Paul declared that Jesus Christ himself revealed the good news to him. He said, I assure you, brothers, the gospel I proclaim to you is no mere human invention. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I schooled in it. It came by revelation from Jesus Christ. And that's an interesting number of Galatians 1, 1, 1 to 12. So I like that. Galatians 1, 11 to 12 makes it easy to remember. So Paul now proceeds to demonstrate the truth of his statement. First, by recalling his life prior to his conversion. And he goes on to say, you have heard, I know, the story of my way of life in Judaism. You know that I went to extremes in persecuting the church of God and tried to destroy it. I made progress in Jewish observance far beyond most of my contemporaries. In my excessive zeal to live out all the traditions of my ancestors. Galatians 1, 13 through 14. And there was that picture that showed Paul guarding the cloaks and Stephen stoning. So now Paul's life prior to his conversion was public knowledge. At his hearing before King Agrippa, he testified that the Jews of Jerusalem knew the life he had lived since his very youth. And he goes on to tell King Agrippa and everyone in the room, he says, they have been acquainted with me for a long time and can testify, if they wish, to my life lived as a Pharisee, the strictest sect of our religion, Acts 26.5. Now, <clears throat> when Paul addressed the Jews in the temple area, he could actually say, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but I was brought up in this city. Here I sat at the feet of Gamaliel and was educated strictly in the law of our fathers. I was a staunch defender of God, Acts 22-3. So pro Paul probably came to Jerusalem now as a young boy to live with his, his married sister, actually. Uh, and you can see more about that in Acts 23, 16. And to study to be a Jewish rabbi. So that's what he was planning to do. 
he says, I am a Pharisee and was born a Pharisee. You see? He sees that as a God-given commission. Took it very seriously, and he was out to serve the Lord in a rather zealot and radical way, but believing this was the way to go. And how often do we see things like that today? The people think they're serving the Lord zealously, and maybe they're off track, you see? So the name Pharisee implies the separated ones, the separated ones. And they were Jews who now separated themselves from anyone or anything that could contaminate them religiously. So the Pharisees strictly observed all the regulations of the Torah and numerous customs and traditions that were added by the rabbis to ensure a strict observance of the law. They accepted the prophets of Israel and staunchly believed in an afterlife and the general resurrection of the good and the wicked. They tolerated no opposing ideas and refused to even associate with those people who held them. Interesting, huh? Paul implies there were distinctions in the degree of observance of the law even now among the Pharisees themselves. And he insisted that he surpassed many of his contemporaries. So he's very puffed, seeing himself as a real dead-on righteous guy, observer of the law. And he became a veritable zealot in the observance of Judaism and in the defense of his God. So what the Galatians were now being taught by the Judaizers, remember we heard about them? The Judaizers trying to bring it back to the law? Well, Paul had even been a stricter observant than they. So you can see how far he came. So now, even as a youth, Paul possessed the purity of soul that enabled him to wholeheartedly follow his religious ideas without tripping over his emotional needs or his psychological deficiencies. You know, we see so much of that today. We have the, you know, it's like the religion of emotion. If you feel good about it, it must be truth. You know, but it's, it's not like that. And Paul was able to separate himself from that. Paul incarnated his faith into zealous action. He got out there. And this is a condition that the Lord loves. He loves that kind of person who, who stands for what he believes in and gets out there and now, before Felix, the Roman uh, procurator, he actually pr uh, professed that, quote, I believe all that is written in the law and the prophets, that there is to be a resurrection of the good and the wicked alike. And that's uh, Acts 24, 15. So because of his hope in the eternal life, he could honestly say, and I quote from Acts 24, 6, In this regard, I too always strive to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Acts 24, 16. So many share Paul's intense faith, but what do they lack? They lack the moral courage and fortitude to practice it to the same degree. And you know, I'd say that of just about anybody. How many people have that kind of courage and fortitude to get out there and do what he did? I kind of call him like a, the, the road runner, you know, coyote who was always having rocks fall on him and the horrible things happen to him and he just keeps going. You know, Paul, no matter what they did to him, stoned him to death, he drowns it's out at sea in a shipwreck, he's imprisoned, he's whipped, he's beaten, he's hated, he's, he's everything and he just keeps on going. So many who come to conversion do not do so with the moral integrity that Paul had. And I'm sure all of us in here have gone through some kind of conversion. I don't know what everybody's experience is, and I'm sure it's fabulous because it's gotten you here in class and you know who the Lord is, and you go to church and you receive the, the Eucharist, and it's a wonderful thing. But if we were thrown into Paul's world, how many of us could perform like him? I mean, really now. He's an amazing guy. So most people 
the emotional disturbances of their lives and the residue of their past evil and not so intelligent choices have taken their toll upon the soul. And it all seems to come up like heartburn, you know? You eat something bad and all that crud's always burning inside you, isn't it? So many must embrace an asceticism of life for some time before they will actually possess the purity and strength of soul to completely abandon themselves to the will of God. And that's true. That's why things like retreats are good to go on. Sometimes you're just going to have to pull yourself out of the mayhem here and go think about it. And Paul had to do that. In fact, Jesus went off and did that. He was always locked in on prayer, getting himself ready. Because the human, the human intellect and the human emotions, pretty weak, pretty difficult thing for us to do, to go ahead with the, with the full abandonment of ourselves to God because we have instilled in us a natural kind of physical survival instinct, just like animals. We try not to get hurt. We try not to get killed. We try to avoid controversy. It's hard to really step out there. So let's look at uh, St. Teresa of Avila. She spoke of the, quote, the bitter bread of self-knowledge. Isn't that so? That bitter bread to be eaten daily along the way in union with God. You find out how weak you are. Find out how sinful you are. Why it was so horrific what Jesus had to go through for us. Because We've done really bad stuff. It's been going on since the first people. We had it all back then, Adam and Eve. They had all goodness, everything perfect. And even then, one little inkling of pride comes in there, and they're now defying God. And there goes paradise. So now Paul stood before the Jewish Sanhedrin, before men who knew him clear from the time of his youth, and before Gamaliel, at who he had sat at his feet, and studied and declared, brothers, to this day I have lived with a clear conscience before God. Acts 23.1. Wow. So nevertheless, there were times when this man with the, quote, clear conscience lived with an erroneous, an erroneous conscience before God. Didn't he? And those errors led a man of Paul's spirit now to fight against the God he professed to love with all his heart. You see how bad the devil can warp everything and turn the truth to the lie? So presumably Paul was absent from Jerusalem during the public ministry of Jesus. Now it would have been interesting to see what would have happened had he encountered Jesus. Wouldn't that have been interesting? But um, that's the way the Lord set it up. So returning, returning sometime after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, he probably encountered Christians for the very first time in Stephen, our first martyr. And it was probably while he was attending the synagogue of Roman freedmen is what it was called. That was the synagogue they probably had in common. And now Greek-speaking Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and Asia attended this synagogue while in Jerusalem. So Paul would have too. And if you want to know more about that, you can see Acts 6-9. So Stephen now, being a Greek-speaking Jew, no doubt attended this synagogue before and after his conversion. So now we are told that Jews from this synagogue engaged Stephen in debate. Remember reading about that? And what did they have to say? They proved no match for the wisdom and spirit of which he spoke. Acts 6.10, that's the Holy Spirit coming through that gives you the words, that gives you that spirit, and no human intellect can refute it. So Paul and Stephen would have been acquainted but were they ever friends? Well, we actually don't know if they were. But um, we do know that Stephen's arguments and preaching evoked a very intense reaction from Saul 
against Stephen personally and to Christianity in general. So it is of interest psychologically now that Paul approved the murder of Stephen but did not personally share in the stoning of him. So we have to kind of look at why was that. He guarded the cloaks, remember? As he later said to Jesus, while the blood of your witness was being shed, I stood by and approved it. I even guarded the cloaks of those who killed him, Acts 22, 20. So if Stephen and Paul had ever been friends, well, the friendship would have ended with Stephen's conversion, no doubt. And uh, Paul was the kind of man who would sacrifice anyone and anything at all for what he believed. So Paul reacted to Christianity with the violence of like a fanatic, a religious zealot, all right? So now he comes before King Agrippa, and here's what he acknowledges. He goes on to say, for my part, I once thought it my duty to oppose the name of Jesus, the Nazarene, in every way possible. That is just what I did in Jerusalem. With the authority I received from the chief priests, I sent many of God's holy people to prison. When they were to be put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time in synagogue after synagogue, I compelled them by force to blaspheme. Indeed, so wild was my fury against them that I pursued them even to foreign cities. Imagine that. Acts 26, 9 to 11. So now Paul goes on to tell the Galatians in so many words that psychologically it was absolutely impossible for a man like himself to have been converted to Jesus Christ Christ by any human presentation. No chance in Hades he would have converted. Something to hear, huh? So now only some extraordinary spiritual experience could logically account for the fact that Saul of Tarsus was now the apostle of Jesus Christ. If that isn't proof right there that something really profound happened on that road, well, there it is. So Paul personally interpreted his vocation to have been kind of in the category of, say, the call of Jeremiah and Isaiah. And there's a picture of Jeremiah there as the scribe is writing away. We read in Jeremiah that the Lord said to him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I dedicated you, a prophet to the nations I appointed you. What an amazing thing that would be to hear from the Lord. And don't think it's not going to all of you too. All right? So that's Jeremiah 1.5. So the prophet Isaiah writes, The Lord called me from birth. From my mother's womb he gave me my name. He made of me a sharp-edged sword and concealed me in the shadow of his arms. For now the Lord has spoken, who formed me as his servant from the womb. Isaiah 49, 1 to 2 and 5. So Paul said to himself, or of himself actually, but the time came when he who had set me apart before I was born and called me by his favor, chose to reveal his son to me, that I might spread among the Gentiles the good tidings concerning him. Galatians 1, 15 through 16. And look at that, that he chose to reveal his son to him. Has he not done that to each and every one of you? Isn't that amazing? The same thing, the same call of Paul. To all us Gentiles being ushered in through Paul leading that way. And here we are, all worshiping God, studying his word, getting out there and doing things in the community, and looking for Jesus' Jesus's face in every person that we encounter. What a glorious thing. We are personally bringing the kingdom of God to San Clemente. 
Isn't that amazing? And to uh, other states too. When we, uh, we hope you take that with you. <laughs> so coming down to closing here, a little bit about Paul after Damascus. Now, the Galatians are familiar with the account of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. The point Paul now desires to stress is that he was not instructed in the gospel by any member of the church following his conversion, was he? He was just kind of out there, hanging on the road, right? What he knew from the gospel, he received through a personal encounter with Jesus Christ himself on this road and also from subsequent visions. He had visions after that too, where God kind of helped him along. But you know, if God should so please, he can just plop information into your head. It's not like you have to get everything out of a book or hear it from somebody's mouth. Sometimes God just says, say this. <laughs> That's why it's always good to pray before you open your mouth. I mean, really, you'd be amazed. Have you ever been talking to somebody and you're like, oh, dear Lord, help me out here. I don't know what to do. And next thing, bam, you come up with something really brilliant. I love when that happens. <laughs> so, so now Paul proceeds to narrate a brief biography after his conversion to demonstrate this above truth. So to say the least, Paul's encounter with Jesus as Lord, right? Not Jesus the man from Nazareth or the man of Galilee. No, Jesus as Lord. He sees the whole thing. This was a traumatic experience that affected every level of his personal experience. And it would. I mean, anybody would have been completely changed. So save his naked devotion to the will of God, nothing in his life now remained as before. He was completely flipped over like a pancake. So to his utter amazement, he, Saul of Tarsus, by the will of God, had suddenly become an appointed apostle of Jesus Christ. Bam, right out of the blue. There you are. All right? So all he could feel was, oh, I'm not worthy. I have been his prosecutor. Those are his own words, by the way. His emotions ran the gamut. Another sign here that you can't trust your emotions because emotions are kind of all over the place and they change minute by second by day. So his human pride was what? Devastated. It was totally devastated by this experience. He was so puffed as a Pharisee. He was just like the guy in the story. Thank you, Lord, that I'm such a righteous and holy man. Not like that sinner back there in the back section, right? So he's just, he, he's crushed. His pride is now in the mud face down. So such an experience for a man of Paul's caliber demanded a time to reflect and contemplate. He must assess this experience in the prayerful light of God's grace. So his past and future life now must be carefully integrated into this divine call. And out of necessity, he must be alone with God now. There's just too much going on out there. How are people going to react to you? What are they going to say? How are you going to explain this? What do I do? Who am I now? I mean, I thought I was the most righteous, God-fearing man in the world. And now I'm nobody. I've persecuted my own God. What are you going to do? So he goes on and tells the Galatians, immediately, without seeking human advisors or even going to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me, I went off to Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. He just had to go off and sit and meditate on what happened to him. And I don't know if that's ever happened to any of you guys. Did you, if you had a certain time in your life when God said, hey, time to take things to a new level, or, or maybe just you went to church your whole life every day the same old thing and then one day maybe you hit rock bottom and you really turned to him but at some point in your life did you say to God I'm yours I'm, you gave me life and I'm returning it to you to do your will whatever you want me to do I'm going to go do it and if that is the pivotal time in your life when you're, you agree to hold up your end of the covenant your end of the agreement 
and show God that how much you appreciate what he had done for us. To think, God, that our intellect can't even wrap around. You know, God is beyond our reason and our understanding. We can't even picture him or imagine him. And so what does a loving God do? Send you himself incarnated. So we have something we can see. How would somebody who's following what God's will is be? How would he be? What would he say? What would he do? And now we know. And we know from all these people how they're changed when they log on to that, when they plug into that powerful force, how their lives are going to change. And granted, it's never been promised that following the Lord is going to make you happy. It's going to make you joyful. It's going to bring you spiritual peace. doesn't mean you're going to have a simple, cushy life. If anything, you're going to take those trials with a whole new understanding. You're going to see the purpose of it. You're going to join your sufferings with Christ's sufferings and say, God, you suffered for me. You know what I'm going through here. And I'm joining my sufferings with you. I offer this to you as my sacrifice. And I'm going to spread every ounce of joy possible to everyone I encounter while I'm down. I mean, that is quite the statement because people know you're not on caffeine. You're not having a great day. You just won the lottery. No, you're laying there roadkill on the on the hospital bed or your world's falling apart or your whole family just blew up in a barn or, you know, a a bomb just hit your airplane, you know, whatever happened to you, that's when you really show that you have faith in God. Those are the times people are going to remember, wow, that person's joyful through all of that. So something to think about. And now some, going back to Paul, some romantically envision that Paul, as did Moses and Elijah, spent time on Mount Sinai. That he must have been up there meditating on all this. However, the journey to Mount Sinai now would have been a perilous journey under any conditions, and doubly so at the time of Paul's conversion. So probably didn't do that. A war raged in the Sinai area that was going on between King Aretas or Aretas the Fourth and the Romans. So Paul probably just returned prudently to the desert area south of Damascus with the Nabatean kingdom. And uh, I'm hoping I'm saying that. It's N-A-B-A-T-A-E-A-N. Nabatean or Nabatean. I'm not really sure. I didn't look it up. So that's where this Damascus is within that kingdom. And there he prayerfully, prayerfully and silently contemplated his commission. And he's just like speechless. The Lord Jesus may well have communicated further with his servant Saul there in the silence of the desert, but we really don't know for sure. But whatever it is, he came out of this knowing what to say and what to do, and nobody taught him. It was God's spirit working through him. So Paul's stay In desert solitude was something less than, they think, like three years. And we next find him giving witness now to his newfound faith in the synagogues of Damascus. There he goes. He's got the fire now. So to the Galatians, now he merely comments, later I return to Damascus. That's all he tells them. But you know, we know where he's going now. He's on fire. So you'll have to come next week to find out what happens from there. (laughs) So give you a little taste of what's coming. Yay. There's there's our beloved Paul. Don't you love that picture? Ah! (laughs) I love him. So which of Paul's traits could not be questioned and which ones could? Two. When did he make more enemies than converts? Here he goes. Three, what humiliating episode occurred three years after Paul's conversion? You know, all this humiliation, it's all part of the training, you know. It's good for us. We hate it more than anything, but it's good for us. So four, what important implications surrounds Paul's private meeting with Cephas? It's an interesting one. Oops, sorry, wrong button. Why did the Christian community have such a problem with Paul? And six, 
How did Stephen's death later affect Paul? Can you imagine? And seven, what is more important than sacrifice and why? Eight, did the Lord deny Paul's desire to make restitution? A little look at that. And what happened during Paul's 10-year silence? There's a good one. We, you know, if you're in a moment of silence, maybe in your life, what was going on when Paul was there? So we have good things to look forward to. So thank you, guys. And uh, there's another picture of him. I've got a whole, all kinds of different renditions of, of Paul. He's like, yes, Lord? <laughs> I kind of like the ones where he's flat on his face. So we'll... Uh, I just, I just, I relate more to that one for some reason. I'm so afraid sometimes evil surrounds me to break my trust in you. To whom shall I turn? For you alone protect me. What can I do? When you are on my side, you were the light of life, you were the end of strife, you were the love for me, you were the light of life.